Thank you for joining me for part two of my 2017 uh, election forecast. My name is Nigel Murray and I'm an independent digital consultant based in Bath. And if you've heard part one, you have heard my summary of what the latest polls are showing and how the polls are split into two groups. And I've made the decision that the final lead that the Conservatives will have over Labour will be uh, 9.5%. But I then ended saying that the um, if the polls are right, it will mark the end of a period where we've had three or four party politics, especially in England, and we'll be uh, returning to the two party politics that we had uh, prior to 1970. And so this starts to raise question in my mind as to what kind of election 2017 will be. And it's basically two types. There's either the type of election that I call typical politics, which is where the standard drivers of voting tend to dominate. And historically in Britain, that has been around age and class. You know, young and uh, working class tending to favour Labour, the old and middle class tending to favour the Conservatives. And certainly in 2015 in England and Wales, we had what I felt was typical uh, politics in terms of the drivers there. Um, and when you have that kind of uh, situation, then a uniform national swing amongst these drivers can often be the best method of uh, forecasting. Uh, <coughs> oh dear, sorry about that. No. Hmm. So, um, a uniform national swing is often a reasonable method of forecast um, in a typical political situation. But sometimes you get situations like what happened in Scotland, where the voters completely realigned themselves in the aftermath of the referendum there in 2014, and a whole swathe of the working class voters that traditionally supported Labour switched to the SNP, the unionist nationalist dynamic really came to the fore, and we just saw something totally different. That the drivers of the, uh, that have been in place in the past in Scotland were no longer relevant, and new drivers had taken their place. And a lot of people have suggested that um, given that this election is taking place in the aftermath of the referendum last year, which resulted in Britain, uh, United Kingdom voting leave uh, on a 4% margin, uh, as to whether or not Brexit is going to be um, a new driver. The polls are showing, uh, especially amongst the self-reporting polls, a major rise in youth turnout. Well, again, that could be a new driver. Y young people tend not to vote. H did the referendum finally inspire them to start voting? So the question has been raised, are we in a voter realignment election or are we in typical politics? And in this section, I'm going to try and answer that question. Now, to start with, I'm going to look at this chart, which if you've been following my polls uh, commentary on my blog, you'll recognise this chart. This showed the um, split of Remain and Leave voters in England only uh, by the party. <laughs> and as you can see at the bottom, what I've just said is that the Tories are munching on kippers amongst the uh, Leave voters and U UKIP voted that defected to the Tory, and as a result, they now have 60% of the Leave vote. Whereas um, Labour now have 50% of the Remain vote. Um, so we can already see a big divide in terms of the two parties, in terms of Remainers and Leavers. Um, so both parties still have a significant presence in the other camp. Uh, but it, what is notable about this for me is the Lib Dem. The Lib Dem, I said, uh, at the time of the Richmond Park by-election, merely winning that wasn't enough. They had to t uh, use that as a launch pad to go further. They had to look at uh, electoral alliances with the Green Party and basically redouble their effort, effort. They really wanted to be the anti-Brexit party and the party of the Remainers. Well, frankly, one in seven is, is a failure. It's a flop. Uh, it can't be dressed up any other way. Even if there's a tactical voting dynamic going on, uh, if I'm a Lib Dem, uh, you've got to be honest with yourself and say the, the strategy has failed. Labour is now the party of Remainers. So we have that uh, split already. Is that a clue that we have uh, a realignment? Well, 
let's go back to 2015 and ask ourselves, well, what were, what demographic best explained the election result in 2015? And I found, you have to take Scotland out for picture here because, um, uh, as I say, it was a realignment election in Scotland. But if you look at England and Wales, this was the dynamic that held strongest in both 2015 and 2010, um, which is the percentage of households without a car. Now, at first you think, well, why is that? But stop and think about it. What demographics are least likely to have a car? Well, obviously those living in cities, particularly with good public transport. Um, those who are young, who have not uh, got their licence or passed their test. Um, and those who are too poor to buy a car. So three demographics there, city dwellers, young, poor people, traditional Labour voters. And as you can see, if you split the 573 seats in England and Wales into deciles, in the most, uh, in the top decile, least likely to uh, own a car, Labour had 55% uh, of the vote in 2015, whereas the Conservatives only had barely 20%. So you know, there's 30% difference between Labour and Conservative voters in uh, these places, mostly in London, um, central London. Uh, and, you know, that was one of the best uh, explanatory variables for the 2015 election. You can see when you look at the percentage of seat, Labour took practically every seat where we have a high proportion of, uh, of households without a car. Conversely, at the other end of the scale, rural dwellers, richer, older people, um, Conservative took every seat. And the differential there was even greater. It was actually more like 40%. Uh, between Labour and Conservative. And it, I find this quite beautiful um, because, to me, it captured a lot of the other dynamics going on. Um, and it would, for me, the biggest differentiator between two parties, this perfect X shape as you move from a higher to a lower decile. Interestingly, the other parties there, um, not UKIP weren't greatly influenced by that um, uh, demographic. Uh, Lib Dems, you can see, are tending to be more uh, like the Conservatives, more do better in areas uh, more rural. The Greens, on the other hand, do best in uh, areas least likely to have a household, again, city centres. So it reflected a lot of the standard demographic that were going on. Now, let's have a look at this black line. That's the Leave vote in those deciles in 2016. And the factor that was the biggest driver of 2015 did an absolute rubbish job of predicting what would happen in 2016. It really just goes to show that the referendum was driven by something completely different. The bottom uh, nine deciles in um, England and Wales all voted leave on average um, with pretty much no different. Only when you get into the uh, the biggest city dwellers uh, group does the leave vote drop off to 40%. And as I say, a lot of these seats were in central London, and central uh, London London did vote 40% uh, leave. Um, and to some extent, the UKIP vote here uh, partly uh, reflects what's going on there. So we had a, a driver in 2015 that did not work in 2016. What driver did? Well, in this one here, uh, you can see the leave vote is now highly correlated with the deciles. It varies from 40% to over 60% uh, from the top to the bottom decile. This one is based on occupation. And when we talk about class, um, occupation is a good description of class. So what I've done here, I've sorted the seat by the differential between the percentage of people working in managerial and professional roles minus the uh, percentage of people working in routine jobs. Um, so at this end, we have a seat where there are more managerial professional uh, people than there are in uh, routine workers. And at this end of the scale, we've got more routine workers than manager uh, professionals. You can see that at that end of the scale, where routine workers outnumbered manager professionals, we had over 60% voting leave, 50% voting labour and only 20% voting Conservative. At the other end of the scale, it, that uh, relationship continued until you get into the most extreme 
uh, the main areas, um, where it started to break down a bit. It seemed to flatten out uh, a bit there. But there's a paradox here. At first sight, it looks like Labour voters are more likely to be Leave voters, but that's actually not true. Surveys have shown that two-thirds of Labour voters actually voted Remain, but the paradox is that outside of London, which mostly voted Remain, 75% of both Labour and Conservative seats in England and Wales voted Leave. So, class was clearly a driver in the Leave vote, but it doesn't necessarily it conflict with class as a driver of the Labour vote, especially when Labour voters are the Remainers. So what's going on there? Well, one way to make, well, the way to make sense of it is that class no longer drives British politics. And indeed, if you look at the polls, many pollsters break down um, class by the standard ABC1 definition for middle class voters and C2DE for working class voters. And we have this quite remarkable situation uh, possibly about to happen with the Conservatives now becoming the party of the working class. I mean, just stop and think about that. Labour was founded um, in the 19th century as the part to represent the interest of the working class. Their history is, is of that, a trade union and working class people. But this election, the Conservatives are going to take over and become the party of the working class. Uh, it, now, if that's not a realignment uh, election, then I don't know what is, uh, to be frank. But it actually been coming. If you look for, uh, at the trends here since 1974, you can see Labour's share of the vote is generally, um, of the working class vote, has generally been uh, below 50% and falling. Um, we've had this rise in vote for other parties uh, since uh, 1983, uh, which is a mixture of the nationalist, but it's also UKIP in a uh, recent uh, period. Now, the Conservative Party is interesting as well, because in 1997 they hit the Nadir, and then over the next few elections they started to make uh, a bigger recovery. Uh, you can see here about a 10-point recovery between uh, 1997 and 2010, where amongst the middle-class voters over that period they didn't make a recovery. So there were signs amongst the Conservative vote that it was already becoming more working class. However, in 2015, we rather reverted to type. They fell off amongst working class voters and increased their vote share amongst middle class voters. Um, but this election, it looked like working class voters are going to defect uh, considerably uh, to the Conservatives. And you can see what's happened here. In 2015, working class voters went to UKIP um, and then now seem to have continued on to the Conservatives. Some people have called UKIP the gateway drug uh, for working class voters here. So, um, but I think the gateway actually goes a bit further because uh, we've got the Lib Dem. It might have gone Labour to Lib Dem to UKIP and now to Conservatives. It's quite a convoluted path when you think about it. But I wouldn't be surprised if that actually happened. Um, the other point to bear in mind when we look at this chart is the fact that... Um, the Labour vote, uh, so far, based on the polls, if they're right, is currently at 34% amongst the uh, middle class voters. And that matches what Tony Blair achieved here in 97. You can see the big, one of the big drivers behind Labour's landslide in 97 was that they narrowed the gap considerably over the Conservatives in the middle class vote. Um, and that was the basis of the Blair landslide here. Well, it then fell away... It, rather than continuing to fall away as the Conservatives uh, started to pick up the middle class vote again, the Labour vote uh, amongst middle class has actually continued to increase. So we have this rather remarkable situation where Labour could now achieve their highest ever middle class vote and the Conservatives become the party of a working class. Uh, well, that's realignment. It means and class is no longer a driver. And indeed, when you look at the vote chairs here, there's not a dramatic difference. Um, so I have drawn the conclusion that we are in a realignment election and therefore we can't use uniform national swing. We have to search for a new kind of forecasting model. And so in part three, that is what I'll describe um, how did I devise my forecasting models.